Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. If you could all take your seats, we'll be able to start. We'll give a couple more minutes to the people in the back. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Guy Lehner, and I'm the Consul for Public Diplomacy at the Consul General of Israel in New York. I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us for tonight's program. The music you've heard earlier was played by Eden Ladin, a third year student at the Jazz Center here at the New School, and the recipient of the American Israel Culture Foundation Award. Mr. Ladin is one of a group of Israeli students here at the New School. Some of them are in the crowd tonight. Tonight's event is an intimate and special program bringing together friends and guests to remember the late <coughs> Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. I, along with, me, with many of you in the audience, as well as every Israeli who is old enough, remember exactly where we were on the night of November 4th, 1995. I remember every moment as if it happened last night. Tonight, we remember Yitzhak Rabin, the soldier, the diplomat, the leader, the men. Now I would like to welcome to the stage the Acting Consul General of Israel in New York, Mr. Ido Aroni, to share his opening remarks with us and introduce our main speakers. Mr. Aroni. Thank you, Gil. Thank you, friends, for being here. I was given the pleasant uh, task of introducing our speakers today. And I'd like to start with the uh, uh, first speaker. Uh, but by the way, both of them need no introduction. But I do it because I know that we're, um, we're actually online right now and there are way more people watching us. So for the benefit of those who are not familiar with the history of our two distinguished speakers, I'd like to begin, begin with Dr. Henry Kissinger. Dr. Henry Kissinger is one of the world's most distinguished diplomats, an illustrious scholar of international relations, and a maker of peace. He fled Germany with his family in 1938 to escape the Nazis, only to return six years later to fight as an American soldier. His commitment to his new country was utter, and he continued to serve with high distinction as the US National Security Advisor and later as Secretary of State during the Nixon and Ford presidencies. Dr. Kissinger had more, more in common with Yitzhak Rabin than just the Nobel Peace Prize, which he won in 1973 for his work to end the Vietnam conflict. 21 years before, he was awarded to Mr. Rabin himself uh, for his own gallant pursuit of peace with the Palestinians. <laughs> Dr. Kissinger was no stranger to Israel, however. After the Yom Kippur War, also in 1973, he was central to bringing about an end to hostilities and bringing relative calm to Israel. <coughs> Dr. Kissinger is also no stranger to me as a diplomat, as I, own much, as I owe much of my understanding of my own profession to him and to his masterful book, Diplomacy. Usually when someone asks me if an American official is good for Israel, I respond truthfully, that if he strives to keep the United States safe and strong and promotes our values of democratic values, freedom, and peace, he is by definition also a friend of Israel. And Henry Kissinger is without a doubt exactly such a person. The second guest speaker that we have here today is Dan Rather. For a generation, Dan Rather has been one of the most recognized and respected names in broadcast journalism. As a young man in Texas, he chose a career that would bring him to fearlessly apply his personal and professional values to the world, freedoms guaranteed by great democracies like the United States and Israel, but alien to so many of our fellow men in more restrictive societies. Yet Mr. Rather never feared to tread there or to ask tough questions when he did. I must tell you again that Henry Kissinger is not the only author whose work played a profound role in my professional career. The Camera Never Blinks by Dan Rather was a key work in my study, not of diplomacy this time, but of media studies. He 
here in America. Although today, truth be told, the two, media and politics, can, it's very difficult to tell them apart. Dan Rather, too, is no stranger to Israel and no stranger to Itzhak Rabin. As the longtime anchorman of CBS Evening News, he reported strongly and fairly on our region, both the good and the bad. Mr. Rather was in Israel when Itzhak Rabin, then our Prime Minister, a man who had fought so hard to achieve peace for his country, was gunned down. And at the funeral, when President Bill Clinton said the final shalom to his friend Itzhak, Dan Rather was the only American news anchor to hear this in person. So please welcome our two guest speakers, Dr. Henry Kissinger and Dan Rather. We're privileged and honored to have uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger with us tonight. And Dr. Kissinger, uh, taking off from that point, I have so many questions, so little time. But in your judgment and with time to reflect, what is the principal legacy of Yitzhak Rabin? <clears throat> you know, uh, Yitzhak, uh, first of all, I want to say, he, I'm here because he was a dear friend of mine. Uh, the fact that he was Prime Minister of Israel and Ambassador, it's important, but uh, it's not why I'm here. Uh, now, what is his legacy? Uh, in my experience, he went through all the ambivalences Israelis must have about the problem of, uh, of peace and the problem of security. Uh, he uh, would have preferred, initially, he was extremely distrustful of the PLO and even also of Arafat. But then as the peace process evolved, he came to a uh, commitment to attempt to contribute to it. And uh, uh, he was really basically very shy and taciturn person. But suddenly, after the peace, the peace process started, he delivered speeches of really extraordinary eloquence so I think, to me, he represents the ambivalences and complexities of the Jewish existence in Israel and the commitment to, an, to find a peaceful solution. When did you first meet him? I met him before I was Henry Kissinger. I was, I, <laughs> I had written, uh, I had written some uh, uh, articles and a book about strategy, and I met him shortly after the 1967 war. I was in Israel, and he invited me to give a lecture to the, whatever I don't know whether they call it general staff to to the generals in his headquarters. And afterwards, he took me to lunch, and we walked through the streets of Tel Aviv. And people were sort of wanting to talk to him. And he, he, had, he had just been the commanding general of the 67 war. And he was embarrassed by all this attention. And that's when we first met, and from then, developed a very uh, close relationship. And what were your first impressions of him? Well, he was very intellectual, extremely thoughtful. Uh, and uh, really more, more substantial than most politicians. And he really knew, he had studied all the things that I had also studied writing 
uh, my book. And uh, so we had a very, what I thought, substantial uh, conversation. But he was not, he, he, he was shy, sort of shy. He was not, uh, he wanted to talk about intellectual things. Uh, but then, as time went on, uh, we, uh, we got to know each other very well. Well, almost anyone uh, who knew him, including people who still write about him, describe him as shy, introverted, taciturn. Would you agree with that description? It's true, but he also uh, conveyed enormous integrity uh, and total reliability and, and extreme thoughtfulness. Uh, uh, he was, a, at first, when I met him, he was a terrible speaker. We were in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles once at some fundraiser, and there were a lot of Hollywood people there, and, and he just didn't feel comfortable. And I, I thought, this really, uh, there must be better fundraisers around than <laughs> uh, but then, which is the astonishing thing, after the peace process started, he gave, I, I don't know if, if any, if none of you have read the old speeches, when he describes what it meant to him to drive on the road to Jerusalem, and, and he gave a whole series of speeches to, to the Congress, in which the speeches were magnificent, and the delivery was, uh, was liberated, and it, it was an astonishing uh, transformation. For, I carried those speeches around with me for many years because, uh, and I still have them. They are they're really extraordinarily thoughtful and eloquent. Dr. Kissinger, uh, when you were speaking of his legacy, in my own personal opinion and judgment that an important part of his legacy is that uh, he ensured Israel's survival and that he was a reality-based, fact-based, short and medium-term pessimistic about the future, but that he gave hope. I want to take you back to just after the 1967 war. What were the, the challenges that Israel and Rabin faced after the Six-Day War? Well, to, to go to your first point for a second, Dan, yeah. uh, his legacy was really, in a way, at his funeral, the collection the, uh, of the assemblage of international leaders, including from the Arab world, who came to that funeral, was an absolutely astonishing uh, testimony to the impact uh, of a man who really hadn't ever tried to make that uh, that uh, uh, that kind of an impact. Now, after '67, Israel was in the position that it had conquered, had defeated all its neighbors. It had its army along the Suez Canal and on the Golan Heights at the. Uh, uh, and it had occupied the Western Bank, and uh, Jerusalem was reunited. Uh, but uh, Israel had not uh, decided what attitude it should take in relation to all these conquests. And on the other hand, the Arab states uh, were not prepared to, to accept any aspect of uh, of the existence of Israel. People now talk about the 67 borders, uh, but no Arab country accepted even the 67 borders uh, at that time. Uh, so there was no negotiation, and, and Israel was in a uh, position of military victory, unable to translate it into political uh, results, uh, the, uh, and almost immediately some military action started again along the Suez Canal, 
uh, and uh, most of the summer of 1970 was was um, concerned with its uh, Suez Canal, with the uh, movement of anti-aircraft missiles to the Suez Canal. Then there was uh, the uh, uh, war in Jordan. Then there was a Syrian invasion of Jordan. So uh, uh, I forget, uh, Yitzhak was not prime minister at the time. Uh, Golda Meir was the prime minister I right left in 67. I think Rabin became prime minister in 73, if I remember correctly. I believe I'm quite right. sure it was 73. But he was present whenever I talked to Golda or to the Israeli cabinet. He was there, I guess, as military advisor. Now, when your memories of, of uh, him when he was Israel's ambassador to the United States. Well, uh, I always repeat the same thing. He was, uh, first of all, it was a very difficult period again for Israel because uh, until 1969, the United States had not delivered any airplanes. Right. Uh, the uh, Israeli airplanes, which won the 67 war with French airplanes. Uh, and in 1969 was the beginning. Uh, most of Israeli arms for the 67 war came from Europe, not from America. So uh, the task of the ambassador in uh, uh, in Washington, the Israeli ambassador in Washington was to create a framework within which the delivery of arms would be accepted first by the Pentagon, then by the Congress, and especially the delivery of uh, F-4 airplanes, of Phantom, uh, Phantom air airplanes, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, that was one of his uh, of his job. Secondly, uh, as the ambassador, uh, there had there were uh, a whole series of economic uh, of economic issues, and thirdly, there were negotiating issues between uh, Israel and the United United States. It was a period of something called the Jaring Mission that was sent uh, from the United Nations. And, and Rapin had to navigate uh, all these uh, elements. Uh, I saw him increasingly frequently because I enjoyed his company. And uh, I couldn't say that about most ambassadors. <laughs> and, uh, it may be true that most ambassadors would not say it about you either. <laughs> <laughs> now they are publishing a lot of the reports of what the ambassadors wrote. They've said worse things than what you just said. <laughs> well, we have this picture. We've said he was shy, taciturn. Uh, he was not the kind of back-slapping, uh, handshaking, winking, joke-making politician who so often succeeds, but in the ambassadorial ranks, particularly when one is going to be ambassador to the United States, frequently a country will pick someone for, among other skills, their social skills, but here's this, he wasn't garrulous to say the least. How did he make out? How, how did he make his way? Uh -huh. He made his way by his intelligence, his integrity, his superb preparation, uh, that you could always learn something from uh, talking to him. Uh, but he apparently navigated all right also in the congressional settings. But I didn't observe that personally, so I can't speak of it. Uh, but he was considered 
by everybody I knew, a very successful uh, ambassador when he, when he was there. Uh, there's a lot of character, and it was a difficult period, so it was, uh, uh, when I talk to him often, not not only about Israel, but about the international situation, especially when it had a military component, because he was a great student of strategy. We know from his background as a, a young, well, as a child and a young man, but his, you know, his background was agriculture and the military. Having said that he never considered himself a politician, it has been said of him uh, that one reason he succeeded politically was because he did not see himself as a politician, and at some base level, most people did not see him as a politician. Would you agree or disagree with that? No, I'd agree with that. I, I mean, he'd focus on a problem. You, he, uh, if, if you discuss the problem with him, he'd analyze it. Uh, he'd give you his opinion, and he was not uh, he, he was not a great compromiser. I, I once, uh, when I was doing the shuttle, uh, I, I went on a trip, and he had made ten points before I left, and I had gotten eight. So I thought I uh, I'd done pretty well. And when I got through, he said. Why have you let me down? <laughs> <laughs> well, we know uh, not only from what he said, but what he did and what his general demeanor, that one would not describe him as uh, filled with optimism about any peace process. But on the basis of what you know, and with time to reflect on it, what was his vision of a peace process? Well, he, he started out as a military man, and uh, he had experienced all the uh, uh, tragedies and the, uh, 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 the tensions. So he was extremely suspicious that you could really get a, an agreement. And I think it is probably fair to say that without Shimon Peres, the original Oslo Agreement would not have been made. That, uh, but then, as he began to get involved in the peace process, his, he developed the vision that the Arab and Jewish people in Palestine should find a grammar of coexistence, and that uh, all the suffering that he had seen and recognized on both sides should find its culmination in some kind of cooperation between Israel and uh, at least the Palestinians. And from original skepticism, uh, he uh, moved into a enthusiastic and a, a, a strong supporter. Those of you who were, who saw on television the uh, presentation of the Oslo Agreement on the White House lawn will remember that when time came to shake Arafat's hands, it took a really heroic effort for for Rabin to put out his hand. It, it was not the most natural movement in the world. Uh, but as it, uh, I, I think by the time he, he was assassinated, uh, he had become, uh, uh, we had, he had become part of the process. And I might mention uh, one of the last conversations I had with him was, was the following. There was an Israeli pilot who had been killed on the last day of the 73 uh, war. And his wife had promised 
had made his son promise that he would not enter the Air Force. So the son entered the Special Forces. Uh, and, uh, and had finished his tour, but there was a kidnapping of some girl in Jerusalem. So he extended his tour by a week and participated in the rescue of that girl. And on the last day of that operation, he got killed. So Leah called me and said, you know, he's had heavy duty today. He's gone to see the mother who now had lost two men on the last day of, of a war. And we talked about the peace process. And uh, I said to him, you know, sometimes I think that everything you've experienced is a sort of preparation for for this for what you're doing now, right. and I hope you look at this in the same uh, way. But of course, Yitzhak didn't like Grant Eloquent's statement, so he's all he said was, "We shall see," uh, and. Uh, but for him, this is what the peace process was about, that, that this sort of experience would not have to be repeated. I understand. I want to take you back to the day that he was assassinated. Give us your, your memories. What was going through your mind the day that he was assassinated? Well, I was, uh, I was in Hong Kong. And, uh, and so there was no possibility for me to get to Israel from Hong Kong in, in time uh, for the funeral. So uh, I, uh, and I was there for some uh, conference, uh, but I was on uh, television a good part of the day talking about my reminiscences, uh, my feelings about Rabin, and actually CNN used what I said uh, as, a, as a voice over while the funeral, right. but I didn't know that. It was just that they kept me on the air for a long time, because, and so that's how I spent it. It was to me a Tremendous personal pain and and also a great sadness because uh, for Israel and for the for the peer, for the for the region because here was a man who had gone through the process of coming to terms with the hatred of the region and trying to transcend them and to be assassinated. In, uh, at an event that was really dedicated to that uh, was an enormous sadness. Did you or did you not think in those hours at the time of the assassination, when we learned of it, and the immediate aftermath, that this would create uh, some new problems for Israel, given that Rabin had this, as you described it, he was trustworthy, he had a great deal of integrity, sharp analytical mind. Did you think to yourself, this is going to be a difficult period uh, for Israel in the wake of this, this shock? And it, it, it was a difficult, it was a difficult period. First of all, of course, the, uh, to create a prime minister in Israel is always a harrowing experience. Uh, uh, yeah. Given the fact that consensus is not the most highly developed Jewish quality. <laughs> and so, uh, 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 but, 
more important than this, uh, uh, Rabin had a gravitas and a seriousness that enabled him to rise above the typical uh, uh, debate. And so it was very hard, and, and, and Israel went through uh, a, a lot of changes. Uh, but he was he was the right man uh, for uh, for that moment, and it it's been very difficult to find somebody who could so incarnate uh, it, the the qualities of concern for security and concern for peace, both. It was. Uh it's been said in the years since his passing, what was said to me at the time, and let me, on a personal level, as a reporter, I often observed this, what I believe to be true, that he had around him very, very few advisors. I don't know that as a professional journalist that I've ever seen a leader of his stature who had as few advisors around him he would have, you know, a communications press persons, other people. In terms of advisors, was that your impression? You know, that's a good question. I mean, it hadn't occurred to me, but I'm sure, I think that's probably true. Uh, I, uh, I mean, if you asked me who was the top advisor of Rabin that you interacted with. I wouldn't really know, uh, but that's partly because he made dealing with me his personal uh, responsibility, but it's probably true. He was a loner in that sense. Uh, he read a lot, was very reflective, loved to play tennis. I don't want you to think that he was a bookworm. Uh, but he was, he was self-contained. Self-contained. Did you ever discuss with him, <coughs> looking toward the horizon, whom he thought would be the most dangerous neighbor of Israel? For example, now here we are in the first part of the 21st century and Iran is obviously a powerful and dangerous enemy and threat to Israel. Well, but in, that's not always been the case. No, in those days, uh, uh, in those days, Iran was a friend of the United States and cooperating with Israel. So he, uh, he would have looked at Iran as it's a, it's a solution, not a, not a problem. And it shows what a tragedy it was in 79 when, uh, when Iran uh, uh, changed sides. Uh, I guess he was most worried. Uh, well, of course, there was always the uh, Palestinian uh, problem, but in most of the time that I knew him, he uh, at first was most worried about Egypt because it was the strongest uh, Arab uh, nation. And it wasn't really until after the 73 war that the idea of a reconciliation between Israel and uh, Egypt, uh, so I would say until 73, Egypt was uh, his principal concern. Uh, after that, uh, he uh, became a uh, supporter of the uh, peace process that had started then, which was uh, to make a series of limited agreements uh, called disengagement agreements. 
and his cooperation in that was essential because he could provide a military judgment that the withdrawal that was taking place, the disengagement agreements were uh, limited withdrawals of Egyptian and then later Syrian forces in return for increased recognition of, of Israel and, and safety uh, measures that were taken in terms uh, uh, of, uh, of deployment. And he was prime minister during the biggest of those disengagement agreement uh, that was just preceding the final agreement that then was made uh, three or four years uh, later. So uh, he had been very uh, uh, positive. Uh, in terms of, but those would have, that would have been Egypt was the big security problem, and after that, I would have said Syria in its mind. Now, I made a note to myself to be sure and ask you, because he was a serious person. He didn't take himself all that seriously, but he was serious about his work, right. serious about uh, what he saw as his mission in life, which was the survival, and not just survival, of Israel but the issues do well in the future. But I made a note to ask you about his sense of humor um, because he rarely had it on public display, but a lot of people who knew him well during his life said, you know, yes, he can be taciturn, he can be, to use your phrase, self-contained, maybe even introverted, but they had a good sense of humor. Do you recall any instance where he played a joke on you or told a good joke or said something humorous? Not to tell you the truth, I mean, I. I think he, uh, but uh, one of my uh, personal difficulties is I can't remember any jokes. So I go through life hearing things that, I, that are very funny and then I don't remember them. But I don't want to mislead the audience. I don't want you to say, I, I can't say that I remember him as, I can't remember any particular humorous. Uh, <laughs> well, let the record event. show that there are people who knew him well. Who, who I, I don't him. doubt that it happened. <laughs> I, let me get the, uh, speaking of the record, let's get this straight. He may have told you jokes, but you can't remember them? I can't quite <laughs> imagine him telling a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but then I must say, this may be a professional deformity of me, I can't remember many people who've told me jokes. That, uh, <laughs> maybe I don't encourage that. <laughs> Dr. Kissinger, I want to uh, paint a word image for you. There's a statue of Yitzhak Rabin. There are a number of ones. But a, um, a child, a fairly young child, say 10 or 11 years old, passes the statue and looks up and says to his adult companions, well, who was he? How would you answer that question? He, he, was, uh, he was one of the first Israeli leaders who had been born in Israel. Uh, he was a man who had grown up in, in Israel, to, who had experienced as a soldier and as a commander the uh, return to Israel of, of, of large numbers of Jews. He had been part of this. And he had seen the uh, growth of the, of the society amidst great dangers and he had to fight in various was, but he had gone beyond this experience to develop a greater vision of what the region might look like and what cut contribution its people uh, could, could make. So that he was a symbol of the origin of Israel, uh, of the uh, evolution of Israel, and of the hope 
of the region and not just of Israel for a uh, more secure and better life. That's how I would describe him. Dr. Kissinger, I know that you have another appointment to get to. Um, I want to join the audience in applauding your being here and giving us these insights. Thank you very much.